my pleasure to welcome you here to the Clark Howard Show. You know, our mission is to serve you with advice and information that empowers you so you make better financial decisions in your life. I was recently taken aback when I saw some of the mortgage products consumers are using right now to seemingly make buying a house at a time they're incredibly unaffordable affordable. But you're playing with dynamite, TNT. Also, okay, back to school. <laughs> oh, man, kids don't like hearing that. Uh, depending on uh, where you are in the United States, schools go back the earliest in late July, the next week and as late as the first week of September. I want to talk about things you need to know for back-to-school shopping that will help you stretch every dollar. And speaking of helping you stretch dollars or grow dollars, I'm so proud of our daily newsletters. And I'm prouder of the price. Free. More proud, prouder. Anyway. So if you go to clark.com slash newsletters, you'll be able to see what we've got for you in store. And give them a try. If you find they're useless, we make it just as easy to unsubscribe as we do to subscribe. So, man, <laughs> I had a call, a question recently on the podcast from somebody asking me about a zero down mortgage. And I went for Fahrenheit 451 instantly. Because if you know the history of the OOs, one of the big components of the banking scandals was where the banks were so addicted to writing loans and then selling them off and doing what were called liar's loans that they'd say, yeah, well, we're just going to put down that you make uh, Two hundred twelve thousand dollars a year. Why well, make forty? Yeah, we're putting down two twelve. Just sign here, and then the bankers were getting their commissions, selling off the loans, and we ended up with the housing bust and the huge unemployment and all that, and it's laid right at the foot of the banks. And I can't believe, because I said after that, we're never going to see anybody do that again. How stupid was I? Here we are. We're not even a full generation away from when those loans were being made. They were called liar's loans. And the full liar lo liar's loans are not back. But one of the components of the liar's loans was 0% down. Don't do it. Don't do it. You will be upside down in your home like you cannot imagine. The other thing that's being pushed right now, 40-year mortgages. You know, with today's housing cost and today's interest rate, if you feel like you really, really got to get in a home, the payments effectively around the country are double monthly rent. And who can afford that? So people are doing things like saying the lender says, well, you know, we can lower the payment to so-and-so. I've got this special loan product that amortizes over 40 years, if they even tell you that. You will be upside down like you can't believe. You'll be in a position where you can't refi when rates do go down. And you're in a bind. So don't do it. Don't do these things. Save up the money for a down payment as hard as that is. And don't extend your loan term past 30. I mean, that's long enough. Yeah. Okay, we'll go to a question that's actually about mortgages. Michael in Texas says, you had great tips on using multiple mortgage companies to get a lower rate. A problem I've found many times in the past is a technique called walking the rate, Ugh. where the mortgage broker tells you at the last minute that they accidentally forgot to lock in the rate and now it's one eighth of a point higher. This has happened to me multiple times, always at the last minute, and would cause me to either have to walk away and find a new lender or at least a 30 day process, 
or accept the higher rate? What tips do you have for this? So, Michael, you're someone who should never buy a lottery ticket. Because <laughs> I'll hear of this happening to somebody occasionally. I haven't heard anybody use the term walking the rate in forever. Um, and it does happen, I don't think, by technique. I think only by, I would hope, mistake. I can't imagine what's in it for the mortgage lender to purposely not lock in. Um, and because this has been a pattern for you, you want to make sure when you're locked in on a loan that you get something in writing from the lender saying your lock-in is in place till such and such a date. Usually be 30, 45 days, whatever it is. Six weeks is common, mm -hmm. at least used to be. And a good faith estimate of closing yeah, good costs. Faith, they're required to give you a good faith estimate. But the locking in the rate, you should receive an email confirming that the lock-in has been placed. And then if the lender somehow messed up, it's on them to absorb an additional cost, not on you. And I just hate that this happened to you on multiple occasions because I've never heard from somebody having this as a pattern. Adam in Idaho says, I've developed a very good savings habit, perhaps too good. Due to being a 26-year-old unmarried guy who lives with three roommates and a decent salary, I've been able to save up a 20% down payment for a house that I would be pre-approved for based on my salary. My question is, how do you set savings goals for something like a house where it seems like you can't ever save enough? When do you stop putting money into savings and start diverting money into a personal brokerage account instead when you know you'll need liquid cash in the next one to three years? I could buy a house now, but it doesn't make sense to me when I can keep my very cheap rent in the meantime while I'm unmarried. And yes, I'm already a member of my local credit union and have always diverted 15% of my paycheck to my employer Roth 401k account. Adam, you know, they say that guys are really desirable now based on credit score. <laughs> You're really there now. <laughs> okay, so uh, that was uncalled for, wasn't it? No, it's fine. Okay, it's okay. So Adam, uh, first of all, congratulations for you developing such great money habits. So we're going to take what you're already doing, which is a great thing. We're going to make it even better. You've already gotten together this enormous amount of cash that's sitting there idly earning whatever, 4 or 5% in savings. What I want you to do now with excess cash is you're doing the Roth 401k at work. I want you now to open your own Roth IRA. Uh, you're 26. At 26, you start popping seven grand into that Roth each year. If you need the money for the house, there are provisions with the Roth that are very favorable to that. But the goal is to put additional tax-free money aside invested for the long term. You're likely not going to need it for a house, but it gives you the, t the power of time getting money into that Roth in your 20s before you have big family obligations. You've got a chance to really build that nest egg and let it run and grow for you through the years. Jordan in Texas says, should we get a home improvement loan? Our house was built in the 1980s and needs a lot of updates. Some cosmetic, but some are necessary. We've updated the kitchen and master bath, but for the most part, the rest of the house has not been touched. We would like to redo the other bathrooms, get new floors and rooms painted throughout the house. We definitely need to replace some windows and our fence will need to be replaced within the next few years. A dream of ours is to convert the back patio into a sunroom. Would it be best to continue making small updates throughout the years, or could we take out a home improvement loan and knock it all out at once? I'd prefer to knock it out all at once and be done for now. We have a home mortgage and about $10,000 worth of payments left on solar panels. Everything else is paid off. We have good, possibly excellent credit scores and have six months worth of savings in our account and are contributing to our 401ks. So, Jordan, I mean, it's like we've got one person after another in this podcast who's living on less than what they make. And it's fantastic what you've already done. You've redone the two big things that real estate agents are looking for. You've redone the primary bathroom and you've redone your kitchen. Uh, buyer to be in the future, that's what they're coming to look for. But I'm hearing in your words 
that this is your forever home because the number of improvements you want to do over the years or all at once are so extensive that normally, and you've got all the construction debris and all that, normally if you want to do that much, somebody might say, you know what? We've loved this house. It's time to move on. People aren't doing that much anymore because the mortgage rates they have are so good. My preference is the opposite, though, of what you asked. I don't want you, particularly at a time of high interest rates, to take out a, a giant new loan to do all these improvements at once. I, I'm not even sure you're aware how disruptive it is if you are redoing that much of your house at one time. It almost becomes hard to live in. But if you keep doing it pay as you go, uh, redoing this bathroom, and then when that one's done, you've paid for it out of your own pocket, and the next one you pay for that, and eventually you put on your sun porch and you do all those things. If you do them one at a time, you're continuing to build equity instead of what may be negative equity, having to take out a loan, pay the interest on it, and do a big job. You're doing so well with money, I don't want you to go backwards. Coming up ahead, a lot of parents dread what I'm about to talk about, back-to-school shopping. The kids dread it because they have to go back to school. You dread it what all the shopping costs. I'm going to try to beat those prices down. Back-to-school shopping is something that is actually more affordable this year than it's been in recent times. And you look at the major components of what's involved in back-to-school shopping, and each of them are cheaper than before. First, um, let's start with electronics. And that's not a new cell phone. It's a laptop. So laptop prices are screaming deals based on historical standards. And I know so many high schoolers want Macs and not Windows computers or Chromebooks. Uh, if you're going to buy a Mac, you got to think about what the uses are going to be. And Apple now sells a full array. They have what's called spread out the buckets. So now Apple has a very confusing number of choices on MacBooks, but they are selling simple M1 chip, which is they're now M1, M2, M3, M1 chips that are street pricing now, it's 600 to 650, that are perfectly fine for school work for most kids. These are not reconditioned, these are not used, these are brand new. I mean, you can walk into an Apple store and spend $5,500 on a MacBook, and every one of them is like more exciting than the next one. But the reality is the use. Always look at the use and whether a Mac is compatible with the school they're going to. If it's Windows, Windows computers that you can buy that are the lead price that generally is around $250 are so capable today versus what a lead price Windows computer would have been years ago. It's unreal. Chromebooks, on the other hand, have gotten much more capable. They're also more expensive than they used to be. There used to be a massive price gap between a Chromebook and a Windows computer, and there still is a big price gap between a Windows and a MacBook, even the 600 and something. I mean, $600 for a Windows computer, you're getting a very high-powered office-type Windows computer. With a Chromebook, what's happened is there's now what they call Chrome Plus, Chromebook Plus, and these are machines that you could use in an office environment. The great advantage of a Chromebook, if, you're, if it's a school system that is Chromebook-oriented, is they really can't get viruses, and that's an enormous advantage. If you do need to know about getting a cell phone plan for a kid. We've written extensively and updated our information for back to school on Clark.com on our cell phone guide. What are the best deals out there? 
And there are actually decent plans starting at $10 a month this year. Um, if you just add a kid to your ripoff AT&T, Verizon, or T-Mobile plan, you're just increasing the pain. And if you do start shopping for a plan for your kid, you may find that you change your own too to a much cheaper plan. So back to school could end up saving you money instead of costing you money. Uh, textbooks, used textbooks, um, buying digital textbooks, renting textbooks, renting digital, these are things you should look at regardless of the school level. And my very controversial thing that I used to do with my kids, buy the last edition of a textbook for a fraction of the cost, they don't miss much. And clothing, thank goodness, thank goodness, it is so in for tweens and teens to wear used clothes. They don't want to go to, well, they, do they still even exist anymore, malls? Oh, yeah. Well, they call it, it's called, you don't say buy used clothes to them. You say vintage. go thrifting. Thrifting or vintage. vintage yeah. yeah. I mean, man, the excess supply right now of used clothing. I talked about that recently, mm -hmm. I think, on the podcast. How much the availability of used clothing has risen. You're going to save money there. School supplies, be careful with those. You can get a big push to buy this trapper keeper or that, depending on the age of the kid. This backpack or that. My backpack advice, okay, I'm Dolesville. You don't worry about the brand on a backpack. You buy a business or traveler backpack. They're much more comfortable for your kids. They aren't going to look cool, but they're much better. They're much more durable, and they're not necessarily expensive when you buy a traveler's backpack. Uh, you can buy one at one of the warehouse clubs, or um, a variety of online sources. Amazon sells a lot of traveler backpacks. Exceedingly more comfortable than the traditional back to school backpack. Also, my kids like, you know, this like Patagonia, those kind of backpacks. You can find those used pretty easily. So, and those are durable too, but they're really expensive if you try to buy them new. Wait, I just talked about don't pay any attention to brand name. Well, if you your say kid Patagonia? is, if your kid's into it, yeah, but you can buy them used. And in fact, I have just recently, I know we talked about this with these clothing, but it just happened to me last week. I saw this sweater that I thought was beautiful and unique, and it was $130 on a website. I looked and searched. I found it on eBay. And it was only in my size. This one guy had this one with new with tags, and I got it for twenty-two dollars. Very good. I know. So you just you know you find stuff you like, and you can buy it used sometimes. All right, we'll go to questions. Ron in North Carolina says, "My wife and I paid the full expenses for our daughter to get a college degree. However, after graduating, she took a job that had nothing to do with her dual majors, communications and film, and did not require a college degree. We feel that our return on this investment is poor." We now regret not making her work in the real world for a couple of years before starting college, making her pay half of her college expenses, and helping her choose a more marketable major in college. My questions are, what is the best method for an immature, naive teen with an underdeveloped brain to choose the right major in college? And two, should parents who pay full expenses of a college consider their funds as a gift to use in any way the child chooses or an investment with an expected return? Have we moved into, is that an existential question? Is that what that's called? <laughs> I don't know if I'd go that far. <laughs> this one's hard. Philosophical. Philosophical. Ron, this is uh, the frustration you have. Any of us, I have two of my kids went the liberal arts route and in their 20s had a rough time launching, like you're talking about for your daughter. The skills that she has are not going to show communication and film aren't going to show in the job market right now uh, historically the stats show it will over time that the things she's learned will come back to benefit her with career mobility when she finds something she gets traction but as a parent waiting for that to happen 
is so frustrating. And it's obvious that if your daughter had gone in one of the career paths that the lists show, you know, the starting pay and the job demand and all that, yeah, she's going to make a lot more money. Even right now, if she went in one of these programs where she got uh, skills in cybersecurity or a variety of other things, which are certificate kind of programs, that she would be able to get out, go out and get a really incredible paying job. But it may not be her thing, may not appeal to her at all. This is really hard. And I don't have the best answer to it. Because if a parent like you, like me, it has, like you, Krista, mm-hmm. is in a position that you've been able to save the money and you let your kid uh, choose, even at an age they may not have the maturity to choose well, I think you have to look at it as you gave them a launch into life and maybe the money was blown. Uh, but maybe not. And time will be the only way to tell. I don't have the easy answer. The good news, most parents can't afford to say, yeah, yeah, just go to that expensive liberal arts school and just go figure it out. They have to, the kid has to go to, uh, you know, maybe community college, go to a state school, and has to have something that's going to pay off because they, the kid may be carrying expensive student loans. I was an English major, by the way, <laughs> and I didn't really, I mean, I probably should have been a communications major. It's kind of funny with the career I ended up in, and, and working on, like, the internet didn't even exist when I was in college, and that's and, my and, first job was working. And on. so if this is any hope to you or help to you, Krista struggled in her 20s. Uh, you worked as a clerical assistant in an office. When I first got out of college, what I did was I worked with a temp agency. And I always, this is the thing, I always worked, I had multiple jobs throughout college, high school, and then after I immediately, I moved to a new city, I signed up with a temp agency and I started working all sorts of things like receptionist work. I cataloged artwork for a company. I mean, I was a barista and I babysat on the side. I signed up with a babysitting agency. So I've always been a hustler. And then I ended up through meeting people. I was a receptionist first for a company that was starting a website. I learned how to do HTML. I'm good with computers, which is funny that I was an English major. And I just sort of got into it. It took me a few years to really And then I met Clark, and I'd never had any radio experience or any in the podcast world didn't exist yet. I helped you start ClarkHoward.com, it was at the time. And, um, yeah, so I feel like it just depends on the person, like what you – and if if you work hard and you figure out, you know, your passion. um, But I was too young to figure it out in college. I I was clueless. And And, I don't think I would have ended up in the job I love if I had just – done a major that would just make me money i think i would have been really unhappy my oldest um you know struggled at different jobs in her 20s she worked in veterinary medicine practice for several years she also work ethic uh she's ended up fine uh career wise she's great in her mid 30s now my mid 20 year old daughter works three jobs trying to figure it out living in one of the most expensive cities in the United States, in Los Angeles. And I know her. She'll figure it out. But she said to me the other day, she said, why couldn't I be like my brother? Her brother is uh, training to be a professional pilot. He's known he wanted to do that for a long time, and that was his path. And I said, well, honey, think of this. If someday planes become automated or there's a new people mover that we get around in, He's going to be obsolete, but you may have skills that work forever. He'll figure it out, too. He will, yeah. Even if there's no more pilots in a cockpit at some point in his adult lifetime. But everybody eventually, hopefully, finds a decent path. But liberal arts majors, the 20s are tough. All right. This is from M in Washington. I've always been a saver since I started working 20 years ago and have been an investor for, since 10 years ago. Um, and then they, she names some of the um, things that she does. I think my net worth is just over $1.5 million and I have a pension wait, plan, and, and too. 20, wait, wait. 20 years uh-huh. of work uh-huh. already have saved or invested $1.5 mm-hmm. and have a pension? Yep. 
but I'm still scared and anxious about spending money, even if it's eating a nice meal out, $40 once a month. This is because I don't know how to deal with surprise expenses. I have a new fear unlocked just recently, the concrete breakage in the northeastern Massachusetts homes where foundations and walls have disintegrated. I also read an article that homeowners insurance won't cover it. It cost, The cost to fix a home's foundation is in the multiple six figures. How do people save for that kind of thing? I would like to not be scared to spend money on myself once in a while, a 2K vacation, a nice meal, or a movie ticket. Thank you for all you and your team do to help me understand how to figure out my worried head. So, M, you need to, you need to have a mad money fund. You, you've saved a million and a half dollars. <laughs> Foundation crumbles on your home. It will be a setback, but it will not be... Uh, and you don't even know if the foundation's ever going to crumble on your home. You know, those foundations in New England, some of them are hundreds of years old at this point, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I wouldn't worry about that. I would come up with a certain amount of money. How you are, have been able to save so much, you're depriving yourself more than you should. I'm the cheapest man alive. How did I get here to the podcast today? You took the public bus. That's right. I mean, because we have a car that uh, is in the shop. We're down a vehicle. So I took the bus. How much yeah. did that cost you? Well, because of my age, it was $1. And the bus was only two minutes late today. This is true. You called me from the bus. Like, this is not a joke. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, being thrifty is th through and through my soul. But do I deprive myself? No. Have you ever seen me deprived? Well, individual things, you'll think I'm silly. Yes, but you love to travel. You spend money on the things that are important to you. Your family, you know, travel time with your family and um, ice cream, right? <laughs> ice cream <laughs> is the one thing in life that no one should ever compromise. I will not eat ice cream with fillers. I will not eat cheap ice cream. I only eat super premium ice cream on Sunday, which is my treat day. And this is serious. And so I'm being serious with you too, at the same time I'm being silly. The point is, I want you to designate X number of dollars a month that goes into diverts from your paycheck into a fun account. And think of it and talk about it as the fun account. And put in a decent amount of money in it because you've got so much money you have already built as a nest egg, you're fine. So start putting money in there and spend it. Don't now treat it as a hoard. You want to go out to eat? Go out to eat. And tie in one credit card that you use for all your fun. Get one of those 2% cash back cards and use it and you pay for it from the money you have in your fun account. And I want to hear from you all the wonderful experiences you've started green lighting and having in your life. Peyton in Georgia says, hey, Clark, I'm a 23-year-old fan who is bad at navigating your website, LOL. I have been training powerlifting pretty seriously and intensely since 2019 when I joined the Air Force. Thank you for your service. I have all other bases covered to make sure my training is optimal. Diet, water, sleep schedule, and chiropractor to make sure I get the most of my body. I wanted to track more information on things like sleep quality through the day exhaustion and I'm training hard enough and if I'm training hard enough and so on. I've been looking at trackers such as Whoop and Fitbit in particular or the Charge 6 or Inspire 3. I was looking to see if they qual if the quality of info provided is what is advertised and if the juice is worth the squeeze. Thank you for your service of educating generations. So I'm not going to, I'm somewhat agnostic on which of the trackers you use. The tracker that you're happy with the data it's giving you is the one you should be looking at. Uh, historically, people that are really into being fit spend a fortune on Garmin devices. Garmin owns the high end of that market, and those trackers are serious money for serious athletes, like on sale. 500 or more dollars. For sleep, nothing beats, uh, this isn't the only one anymore, the Aura Ring, the new Samsung Ring, and then some lower cost third party rings that track your sleep to a level 
that is shocking. Uh, you know, none of the uh, wrist devices seem to be as capable as a ring that you wear, and I wear mine around the clock except to charge it. The health data I get is extraordinary. You know, I, I didn't mention that I had COVID recently, and the Aura knew I had COVID. Didn't call it COVID, but knew my health numbers in all these categories, and it gives you a health number every day, collapsed. And then I watched it as I recovered. It didn't go straight up, but it went back up. And it, it is invaluable, the information that you can get from these devices now. And I see a lot of used Aura rings online that you could buy. For, you still have to pay the monthly fee, but if you can buy a ring very cheaply. But a lot of the rings, like the, the one from Samsung, no monthly fee. Oh, a lot good. of them are free of a fee. And there are rumors that Aura will have to change its business model is the only one I think that's left that's charging a monthly fee. And but, you can use your HSA account for a lot of these devices. I mean, check with your HSA administrator, your health savings account, or he, flexible he, savings. He's account. military. Oh, okay. So I don't think there's access okay. to an Got HSA. Well, but for, for other, other people. people. Yeah. <laughs> but again, thank you for your service. And uh, I think that's cool what an incredible athlete, a fitness person you are. And I want to thank you so much for joining us on today's podcast. It's been great having you with us. And look forward to serving you on Wednesday.